to welcome today to our juxtaposition lecture series here at the Berlin University of the Arts as part of the Studium Generale. A curator, a writer, an editor, a contemporary intellectual and a thinker, and that's Schumann Bazar. Um, so let's start on the personal note before I come to the more kind of CV notes. Um, Schumann um, is an incredibly, incredibly inspiring thinker for me personally. We kind of, I would say, engage in similar worlds. We are both interested in the mediation of contemporary culture or contemporary reflexivity. But I always feel that Schumann is like three steps ahead of me um, in the way he kind of approaches the world, in the way he finds a good, the right words for it, also visually and language for these things. And um, so, um, you, having you here today, Schumann, is a really great pleasure, um, both professionally speaking and personally speaking, and because there's a lot to learn from you. There's really a lot to learn from you, and um, I don't know, you have that probably too, but there's always contemporaries that you really are very inspired by. No? And this is, I have to say, with, I can say this with great admiration, um, that your shit is on point. Shuvan, your shit is simply on point. But now to the more uh, professional side. Um, you are the author, you also brought them, of two books, um, The Age of Earthquakes and The Extreme Self. Both of them you authored, edited together with Hans-Ulrich Ubrist, who was actually also a guest here in this juxtaposition lecture series in the very first semester two years ago, and uh, the Uber curator of curators, and Douglas Copland, who is a very known science fiction author. And these are masterpieces. These two books are masterpieces and must-haves. But um, you also work, um, yeah, as a curator, for the lack of a better term. You've been the commissioner of Art Dubai's Global Art Forum, I think since over a decade or something like that. You are a member of the um, Fondazione Prada's Thought Council. That's kind of a very selected few of the thinkers of tomorrow, kind of, that come together there. And you're Chief Narrative Officer at Zine. You're the curator at Forum do Futura and at Art Jamil. And you have various editorial roles at magazines such as Tang, Bidun, or O3-2C, and Flash Art. And, um, yeah, um, um, all of that said, I'm, I'm very, very excited to have you here and share your practice, your world, your view on the world and your approach to the world with us here, a very mixed bag of students from very different disciplines. So, all of you, a warm applause for Schumann. Nope, not yet. Hello, 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 hello. Hello, yeah. yeah. This sounds very good. Now we're on. We're good. We're good. Okay, great. Um, Hi everyone, uh, thank you so much uh, Lucas for such a um, heartwarming um, introduction, it, it means a lot um, and it means a lot to be uh, amidst um, this uh, group of people that you've brought together, some of whom I, I know, some of whom I don't know, but as somebody that also um, very much values, I think, um, sort of heterogeneous ways of thinking and trying to find relationships between things that don't seem initially related to each other. Um, I think this is, you know, this is such a fantastic uh, resource that, you know, Lucas and, and the university have, has put together, and I hope I do it justice. I just realized, though, that my, I, I don't know, how, how many of you use CoStar? Yes. Yes? Okay, <laughs> so CoStar has just said to me, good evening, Schumann Basar. It's Monday, June the 19th. Less talk, full stop, more action. <laughs> so I, I'm very conflicted now. 
Like, what do I do? <laughs> I'm going to have to go against um, uh, NASA big data. <laughs> um, but um, let's see if I could try and bring those two things together. I, so what I've done is I've put together uh, a talk that is ostensibly in two parts. Um, so the, the first part is, uh, is an example of the things that I've done, particularly as uh, uh, Lucas uh, just mentioned, uh, these, two, these two books, which actually emerge from, a, from an exhibition. Um, and then, uh, and, and this is really to give you a sense of, uh, I guess, maybe ideas that I think are important, but also formats that I think are important and the relationship between ideas and formats. Um, and then the sort of second part of the talk, part two, uh, in, very, in a very heartfelt way, wants to offer you possible tools with uh, which to conceive of each of your own personal futures. And, um, and also tools, perhaps, to importantly, importantly um, look back uh, on what you will have done. So this sort of relationship between the, the sort of fu the future trajectory that you to some extent will and won't be architecting yourself. But as important, I think, is how you, how you look back on everything that you've done. Um, and how you kind of narrativize that, right? Um, so that's, that's the sort of second part. As, um, as a prelude, I sort of put together these two, uh, these two quotes, and I very immodestly um, you know, set myself uh, against, I, to me, one of my most uh, important kind of inspirations, um, brain crushes, which is the writer, thinker, uh, Susan Sontag. And she once said, uh, or she sort of had this description that's always stayed with me, which is, an intellectual is, some, is someone who pays attention to the world. Someone who pays attention to the world, right? Now, this, is, this has been something that I've thought about now for like 30-odd years. Um, but more recently, I... Uh, so one of the things I love to do is produce uh, neologisms. So neologisms are new words or new terms. And in a uh, sort of recent, um, I'm sort of writing a trilogy around something called LORCOR, L-O-R-E-C-O-R-E. -E. And um, so I've got something called the lexicon of LORCOR, which are 52 new terms. And one of them is this, which is what I call the distraction economy. Which and the distraction economy is uh, the attention economy rebranded to more accur ac accurately describe its working mechanism and goals, that of harnessing people's weakness for endless dopamine-driven distraction. So, I'm, hopefully, some of you have heard of the the attention economy, um, which is you know one of the very many different names given to uh, you know the the, the kinds of capitalism that have um, been produced in certainly the last decade, decade and a half, um, that's very much obviously uh, related to our kind of, um, you know, pathological ad addiction to, to content. Um, but it struck me a few months ago, actually, while doing a, a conversation with Simon Denny, who some of you will know, who's an, an artist and also kind of a professor of, of art, um, that what we call the attention economy is actually something that we should call, really call the distraction economy, right? Now, I, I introduce this, or I, I want to start with this because I think, um, you know, just to put sort of two notions in your mind as we, as we get going, the first is that, you know, change is always changing. Um, and, and the second is that words and language are, are a way to access this sense of change changing. Um, 
so with that, let's, let's get started. Um, okay, so this is another uh, maxim or uh, phrase that uh, I've been thinking about for a very long time. Um, and it comes from a text that <coughs> Samuel Beckett on the right uh, wrote about his mentor, um, uh, James Joyce on the left. Uh, James Joyce was um, spent a very long time writing the sequel to, to Ulysses, <coughs> which uh, eventually became Finnegan's Wake. But it, it had all these like intermediary stages to it. And he had various people that he trusted uh, to act as readers and editors, and Samuel Beckett was one of them. And in a sort of early uh, iteration of Finnegan's Wake, uh, Beckett um, describes what Joyce is doing through this, through this kind of, um, through this, it's like a couplet in a way, right? Form is content, content is form. And, um, and this is something like I, uh, it's, a, uh, it's a kind of article of faith as far as I'm concerned. Um, this relationship between form and content. Um, but of course now content means, um, means something else on top of what it had meant perhaps at the time of, uh, this, was, this was written in about somewhere in the 1930s. Um, you know, we talk about content being king today, no? We're, we're also in a kind of content economy, the attention economy, is related intricately to the, to the content economy, right? And, and so this idea of, you know, whether it's IP, um, ideas, um, anything that you produce, now everything can get funneled into this notion of kind of content, which is, is, a, is a kind of, you know, it's a sort of contemporary sludge in a way. Um, but, you know, content always, comes or always takes a form. Um, and this, I think, is a way to set up uh, uh, the, the two books and the exhibition that I want to talk about briefly. Um, so on the left here, another very important figure to me, Marshall McLuhan, um, a Canadian, um, well, perhaps, I mean, one of the, really the uh, first and foremost uh, media theorists, uh, but he, he also had a very interesting trajectory where he studied uh, English literature and actually taught mostly in the English literature department at the University of Toronto um, while setting up this kind of um, uh, dedicated centre for media and technology. Um, but in 1967, he and um, two other people who I'll um, introduce shortly uh, released this book called The Medium is the Massage. And, you know, this book, uh, I mean, I'm showing you the hardback here, but it really became this cultural milestone, um, very much part of the sort of countercultural uh, late 1960s. Um, it was really a, a, a landmark paperback book. Uh, and what it was put together by... Uh, these two, uh, these two gentlemen, in the middle, Jerome Agel, who's a very interesting and sort of mercurial character, who came from the publishing world, and decided that what he wanted to, uh, he wanted to kind of invent a position uh, in the world, and he was, you know, he was very, he was very much inspired by George Martin. George Martin was the producer for the Beatles. And, you know, the Beatles often refer to George Martin as, as the fifth Beatle, for example. Um, but, you know, you, uh, so you had this figure of the record producer, and the record producer, you know, already by this time had, was becoming, like, a very important, like, author figure, without whom the music and the band couldn't be kind of conceived in the same way. Elvis, Elvis Presley had a sort of similar relationship to, to his producers. And, um, and so Jerome Agel said, you know, I want to be to books and to um, thinkers what George Martin is to, is to the Beatles. 
And on the left here, you have Quentin Fiore, who's a graphic designer. Um, and so what happened was that Jerome Agel and Quentin Fiore approached Marshall McLuhan, who up till this point in the mid 60s had become something of a, of a, of a sort of academic celebrity, but was very much confined to the academic world. He'd written a number of books like The Gutenberg Galaxy um, that uh, were, were very kind of groundbreaking, but they were written in a very dense, uh, opaque and academic way. And Agel believed that the ideas that McLuhan had were too important to be uh, sort of um, imprisoned in the academy and that he and Fiore needed to, to develop a format that would allow these ideas to escape the ivory tower and kind of proliferate through the world. And the brief that he set himself, which is such a beautiful brief, is, you know, I want to make McLuhan's ideas understandable to a 10-year-old child. And, you know, so they chose the, they choose the, um, the paperback uh, as, uh, as the format through which they're going to do this. And this is, um, this is the, the, in 1966, the year before the book comes out, Agel was also, he was a great, um, uh, he was a great marketeer. He knew about hype, he knew about how to reframe things so that they would uh, capture people's imagination. But I really love this. So a book that will show what's happening when what's happening is happening. <laughs> it's beautiful. It predicts the present. It predicts the present, which, uh, yeah, this blows my mind. Two clues. The thing, uh, the thing of it is, Montaigne said, that we must live with the living. And the songs made me, Goethe said. Um, but the bit I want you to think about here is that it predicts the present. It predicts the present. And Fiore, uh, you know, came up with this incredible uh, design for the book, where he was inspired by, really by cinema, um, but really, you know, uh, cinema as it used to be in, in its original format, let's say kind of 35 millimeter, um, where you would, you know, you'd, you'd look at the, 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 the film strip, you no, know, and you would see frame, uh, would have been 24 frames per second at that point, you would see frame by frame, no? you'd see change, almost like a kind of animation. You know, cinema is, a, is an illusion, right? It's an illusion of movement that's made out of, of stills. And so what um, Fiore does with the medium is the massage is he thinks of each uh, double page spread as a kind of film still. And so the way that you move through the book is like you're moving through a kind of cinema, but it's a cinema, you know, of, of like, uh, Soviet uh, kind of experimental modernist cinema like Eisenstein or Vertov, no? where um, you'd get these incredible jump cuts no? from uh, like, I don't know, Bat Battleship Potemkin, no? from the, the sort of close-up of the eye to the pram going down the stairs to like someone screaming. No? This, and the, the, the amazing thing about cinema um, is that way in which it can kind of make these jump cuts of scale. No? It can can zoom into somebody's face, and we can zoom out to like the earth. You know, there's very few media that was able to do that, do that up till this point. So Agel, uh, sorry, Fiore creates arguably a new kind of format for this book. Um, and it now is, as I say, it sold a million copies. It made McLuhan, it's very famous, um, kind of intellectual, pop intellectual of the late 60s and the early 70s. And, um, but also as a, as a kind of, uh, as a piece of graphic design, as a piece of communication design, I think it's one of the most important um, uh, works of the late 20th, of the second half of the, of the 20th century. If you don't know it, I urge you to, to go and check it out. But um, what happened was that in uh, Douglas Coupland, uh, uh, our friend um, wrote a, a biography on McLuhan in 2010, and you know I read this biography, and it was a kind of amazing reminder, uh, or a kind of excavation, perhaps is a better word, of the, of the, of the profound kind of prescience that McLuhan had. Um, and Doug has a beautiful way of saying that, you know, McLuhan, uh, he saw the internet coming, but he didn't figure out what the interface looked like. So he, you know, he was obsessed with what he called uh, electric technology, 
you know, radio, uh, television, magazines, advertising. Um, but he applied, as I say, he applied this like amazing scholarship. He was a James Joyce scholar, so there's a kind of connection back to James Joyce. He was actually a Finnegan's Wake um, devotee and, and uh, uh, great kind of theorist of Finnegan's Wake, because the thing about Finnegan's Wake, if you've never seen it, it's, it's entirely, it's a, it's a book made out of a, a, a kind of babble of languages. So Joyce literally invents language, which is a, a sort of Gesamtkunstwerk of existing languages all that kind of proliferate with each other and create new languages. Um, and so, you know, Douglas then asked myself and Hans Ulrich, he said, well, why don't we, we should, some, nobody's done an update of the medium as the massage for the 21st century, for our digital age. Why don't we do it? And we were like, okay, let's do it. <laughs> and so this really became the, the premise of the age of earthquakes. The subtitle is A Guide to the Extreme um, Present. And, um, uh, and, and the important thing here is to, uh, is to actually keep that format of the paperback. Uh, which, you know, the medium of the message had. Uh, it was fantastic because that book was published by Penguin in 67 and Penguin picked this up and published this in 2015. And, you know, they understood that this, in a sense, was a kind of sequel to that book for the 21st century. And, um, and so the way that uh, the Age of Earthquakes works is, you know, we've written the text together then we send the text out to, at that point, about 40 different uh, visual artists, photographers, mostly at that point. And, you know, we ask them to uh, send images that would relate to specific parts of the text, but it was really up to them. Um, and in a way, I, I now think of it, I didn't at the time, but now I think of it almost as like using a group of people like a search engine, like an image search engine. Um, where our text was like the prompt, no? So, um, so these were the, the, uh, the group of artists that sort of produced uh, the images for us. And then, um, you know, here are some of the, uh, some of the, uh, the, 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 the spreads um, from the book. Um, so, you know, what happens is it's our text, which is often then overlaid or juxtaposed uh, or runs adjacent to images that people have, have sent us, no? And, and I'll talk about this a little bit more uh, with, the, with the extreme self. Um, and this is how the book starts, just to give you a sense. Uh, but also the, the content here is important, I think. Have you maybe noticed that our, lo our lives are no longer feeling like stories? Our lives are becoming a lineup of tasks. Our sense of time is beginning to shrink. Um, so we, you know, the neologism in this book was the extreme present. What is the extreme present? Well, it's the, the realization that the causes of the modern condition are not going away. The forces driving the current world will only accelerate. Um, we had 28 um, neologisms in this book, and one of them was proceleration. And so proceleration is the acceleration of acceleration, right? So it's a kind of... Uh, exponential curve of change changing, which then, um, you know, produces this other term that I have, which is change vertigo. So change vertigo is the disorientation brought on by change changing faster than one's ability to comprehend it on a, on a daily basis, right? So that, you know, that book came out in, say, in 2015. And in a way, it was a portrait, uh, sort of condensed portrait of what I call uh, the first condensed decade of the 2010s. Uh, I think decades no longer necessarily take 10 years to elapse. Um, so I think the first decade uh, of, the, of the 2010s was roughly from after the financial crisis to, at that point, 2015. And then the next decade starts really in 2016. Um, and so this, you know, our, our sequel, The Extreme Self, becomes uh, a portrait of the sort of second decade of the 2010s, um, which runs from 2016 really till the pandemic, till about, till, till the book came out, which is 2021. 
And, you know, on the back of the book, it says, if you're wondering why the inside of your head feels so strange these days, this book has the answers. Um, here's one of the spreads with an amazing image by Pamela Rosenkrantz, where we say, you know, we're not built for so much change so quickly. Technology has outrun our ability to uh, absorb it. And um, uh, this was, yeah, obviously from, from Dazed, and it says this novel asks how humans can weather this era of, extre of extreme change. And so what, whereas we were really mostly interested in, in a sense, the um, question of and the experience of time uh, in the extreme present with, uh, with the extreme self, the question we um, started with is, um, is individuality still the same thing that it was even five years ago or three years ago? Or has it, in fact, um, mutated and morphed into something um, almost unrecognizable? So that, that was really how we, we sort of started it. Um, similar kind of process. We wrote the text. The text was sent out. This time, 73 contributors. A broader range. We also have like uh, musicians like Fatima Al-Qadiri, um, fashion designers like Craig Green, um, uh, so again, but it's a very similar process. No? You, you're using a group of people almost like a kind of, somewhere between a search engine, but also like a, like a, uh, like a stable diffusion image generation that's reacting to a set of prompts. So this is how uh, this book starts. You know, the 20th century was uh, about what belongs to who. The 21st century is about who belongs to what. For thousands of years, Earth's resources have been extracted by bodies, most of whom were not free. But now it's our bodies and ourselves being extracted, and mostly we offer it up for free. By merely existing, you're leaving a huge data smudge in the world. But it's not in the physical world. It's up in the cloud forever. Um, and here on the right is uh, a list of all the different ways we basically leave kind of digital residue. You know, every time we interact with our device, with the internet. Um, uh, and I like to think of, you know, this on the right as a, uh, you know, this is one of the most contemporary forms of portraiture today, right? Like every single one of us will have a, uh, this kind of um, user trail uh, this user residue that is unique to every single one of us. And, you know, in a similar way, if you think about, you know, your DNA, you know, all these things that are unique, you know, your fingerprint, your gait, how you walk, uh, your, date, your sort of data residue, um, your, your um, online history is also one of these, like, extremely unique crystallizations of who you, who you are. The cloud is the new infinity. Feelings now legitimize lies. Could the expression of empathy be our new Turing test? We were wondering, do you still feel like an individual? 20 years ago, this question would have made no sense. Now everybody knows what it means. We all know that we're changing inside our, inside our heads quickly, too quickly. Up until recently, people were simply people. Now we're turning into something else. We all feel it. We all know it. It's all happening faster than we thought. What if we need a new word to, to describe this thing that individuality is morphing into? You're now becoming your extreme self, and it's happening to you as you read these words. Okay, so that's really what we kind of mean by this uh, this term, the extreme self. And um, just a little bit, I would sort of now want to talk about a little, just zoom out a little bit and. Uh, talk a little bit about the kind of format uh, or, or this relationship between form and content. Um, you know, some of you will recognize this. This is an adaptation of the, uh, of the political compass, um, which, you know, something became very uh, prevalent post-2016. Um, but, you know, here, sort of repurposed with this idea of me, you, us, them. Um, and, you know, another thing that uh, we've been thinking a lot about is, of course, the, the, the 
the forms of communication that we we employ, and um, you know something like I, I mean I wish uh, McLuhan was alive to uh, reflect on you know on our uh, kind of universe of of using emojis because you know one of the the sort of um, deep historical and anthropological studies that he he, he embarks on, which is, um, you know, which is a sort of conventional understanding that we that humans, over time, moved from, you know, forms of uh, like abstract written language. You no, know? so if, or if you think of like like hieroglyphs or pictograms, you no, know? there was this sense in which you would, the thing you wanted to say would have to be inscribed, using the thing that you wanted to say. Right, so. Um, and then you gradually get a process of abstraction. No? So what is the alphabet? It's a, it's a completely abstract, it's a kind of abstract graphic uh, system of notation that has very little no, to do with the things that it's, it's referring to. And so, you know, generally speaking, over thousands of years, we've gone through this process of like abstraction. Now we've gone back to like uh, almost like a, a neo uh, pictogramization, no? a sort of re-embodiment of, of language um, that relies on, on this kind of image forms or these like image text. So, and you know, and one of the other things that uh, we say is that, you know, we, we're, we're also, um, I mean, technology is producing new feelings and these new feelings need, need new languages. So they need new words, but in a way, um, and I'm sure you all have that thing, no, where you're you're texting and it, and you want to use an emoji, and then you kn you know you know the, the extreme nuance difference, no, between this smiling emoji and that smiling emoji. No, it's just like it might just be one sim single kind of groove, but it makes all the difference. No? Like, and we're getting, and obviously every year Unicode has like tens or hundreds of new emojis kind of added to the lexicon because we want to be more and more specific. We want to be more and more, more accurate. So, you know, one of the things we do in, with this project is we, we sort of also create these new emojis. So, you know, here on the left, you've got the kind of exploding head and the, the water drop or the teardrop. Obviously, it means different things. And the, the, the uh, indispensable whole void which you know, we put together with our designer, Wayne, Wayne Daly, which then produces this thing on the, this, um, this kind of emoji on the right. Um, we did that for, uh, for uh, the beginning of the project. Um, and then when we were designing the new book, um, you know, we, were, uh, we were obviously thinking about what needed to go on the cover. And, uh, and then Wayne, our designer, came up with this, this beautiful kind of concept you know, of... Um, you know, if you think about the Matroska doll, the famous Russian dolls, no, of like a small doll and a bigger doll and a bigger doll and so on and so forth. And so he had this wonderful idea, no, that um, the the way in which we feel feelings today is, you know, in a single minute, you know, we might feel anxious, uh, horny, and then like suicidal. <laughs> Um, and all, all three of, you know, we can feel basically all three of those things at the same time today. And so how do you, you know, how do you, how do you represent that visually? So Wayne had this wonderful, like, idea of, uh, of, you know, these three different emojis somehow, like, nestling into each other, which I, I kind of love, which then becomes the, you know, is, the, is basically how it works on the, on the book. And, and in a way, I think this visual is really... Um, great and accurate um, manifesto, I think, for, for what, we're, uh, what we're trying to do with, the, with this project. And um, uh, just to end this first part, the, uh, the, this book actually came out of uh, an exhibition that we'd been commissioned at the Museum of Contemporary Art in Toronto, which opened in September 2019. And, um, and, you know, that was commissioned because the artistic director really loved the age of earthquakes and uh, wondered, uh, you know, said to me, I, I, I imagine what it would be like to, to walk through the book, right? Like, 
and, and I said, oh, that's, that's a really interesting thing to say because Hans Ulrich, Hans Ulrich um, always described uh, the age of earthquakes as an exhibition in a book, as a portable exhibition. Like, that's one of the ways in which the book can be thought of. And so, you know, we, we got to use this exhibition really as kind of R&D for the, for the book. And um, so September 2019, um, we opened this exhibit, you know, an exhibition in, in Toronto. And then the exhibition uh, came down literally the week that the world, or that COVID was discovered in Wuhan. And, uh, and then, it, we, you know, we, we took the exhibition to, to Dubai, got delayed, and then opened at uh, the beginning of um, January 2021, where it's obviously still COVID, um, although Dubai had done, you know, it's one of the places I live, and <clears throat> Dubai had done a very, uh, like, uh, logistically, technocratically successful job at sort of containing, vaccinating people so that there was a return a certain return to public life, maybe quicker than had happened in other parts of particularly the Western world. Um, and so, you know, you see here, we made this huge banner um, on the outside of the building using our, our new kind of emoji and also this like, um, this uh, political compass that's re refashioned. Um, and, then in, and then this kind of emoji thing also uh, continues in the, in the exhibition, this is a project uh, by Yuri Pattison, who's a really fantastic uh, artist. And Yuri was interested in um, in the uh, uh, in this in the eye emojis. And so what he did was he took the five eye emojis from the five diff most sort of used social media platforms, um, and then ran it through like a Photoshop, the Photoshop array feature. And photo, the Photoshop array feature uses a very simple form of AI, actually, because you can tell it to create a uh, non-repeating pattern. So he then created this amazing like <laughs> um, wallpaper out of the um, out of the these like eye emojis. Um, this was in Toronto. Uh, this is in you know in um, in Jamil. Uh, in Dubai, where we we wallpapered the, ins the inside of the elevator, um, but you know he's 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 also you know it's obviously a play on like surveillance on these eyes that are looking at you, but you know our um, uh, our emoji usage is you know is one of the major kind of metrics that is used today, um, certainly by advertisers by you know, marketeers, et cetera, et cetera. So it's another way in which, you know, our kind of collective emotional temperament is, I mean, it's how we express it, but it's also how it's being tracked, you know? And so Yuri is, is sort of playing with this uh, visually. This is just to give you, I just want to walk you through the exhibition very, very briefly, just to give you a sense how it, how it looked and how it felt, because this is sort of interesting, because, you know, we essentially blew up the pages to these large poster size forms which are then suspended from the ceiling and organized chapter by chapter room by room so you literally have to walk around the pages of the book uh, but in addition we had like a dozen different artists um, and also different kinds of projects that were interspersed um, that you know would then react there are 12, uh, sorry, 13 chapters in the book. So you have different artists responding to or articulating these the, the, the themes from the book, but you know, in their own language. Victoria Sin, who's now uh, uh, goes by the name Sin Wakin, um, Satoshi Fujiwara, who's an amazing Japanese photographer who's based here in, uh, in, in Berlin. Actually, I really recommend um, Lucas to invite Satoshi, um, created this like three-story high um, photographic sculpture, um, really fantastic. And um, Stephanie Sade, uh, it's beautiful work called DigiPrint. Um, again, just to give you a sense of, you know, you're sort of moving through, you're moving and reading. So it's this idea of like reading, moving, scrolling, swiping, all at the same time. You're, so that was the opening, no? So it's this kind of surreal um, feeling 
uh, in January 2021, where we're still in the pandemic. And you know, we, we, I sort of updated the content of the exhibition and the book to reflect how the pandemic had now pushed us even further into our kind of next um, reality. Uh, and this beautiful um, lava lamp heads by Jena Sutella, who's a, also a Berlin-based Finnish artist that some of you may know. Um, but you can see here on the right, this is actually how the exhibition ends, with this three and a half meter high <laughs> emoji hole. Um, but you know, simply by turning it 90 degrees, it becomes a kind of portal. Um, and, uh, and of course, at that point, you know, we're, we're, as I say, we're still barely, I mean, we're nine months, 10 max into the pandemic. You know, so this sense of wanting to be able to be transported somewhere else, potentially away from, you know, this, um, this kind of viral nightmare that we'd entered, entered into. So that's the end of uh, part one. Part two, I'll, I'll move through. How much time do I have? Like 10 minutes? 10 minutes, yeah. Okay. So part two is, um, as I say, I, uh, in a way, is me being, I think, as straightforwardly um, uh, like advice oriented. You know, I'm someone that has taught for a long time. I don't teach formally so much anymore. I think of what I, many of the things that I do of having a kind of pedagogical function, but I don't necessarily teach in a formal pedagogical way, but I did for a long time. Um, and so, you know, what I wanted to do here was just put together a number of things that, you know, I thought about when I was maybe your age um, and sort of just after your age and, uh, uh, and you know, maybe they'll be kind of helpful or, or, or useful. This was a, an essay that I wrote back in 2006 uh, in a book that I did with Marcus Meeson, who some of you may know, a book called Did Someone Say Participate? And I wrote this, um, um, this essay called the, Pro the Professional Amateur. And, um, you know, in a way it was a, it was a sort of, ro it was like a, um, a sort of an, a romantic appeal to this idea that it would, you know, maybe it's more cunning to stay um, like something of an amateur rather than a professional in whatever discipline you choose to do. And that, you know, one of the traps in a way is over professionalization. Um, and that, uh, but if you're somebody like me who's interested in multiple things, then somehow being on the kind of edge of being an amateur and a professional of several things allows you to sort of bring those things together and produce, let maybe say, a new kind of schema of knowledge that would not be accessible if you were only a professional in one specific domain, right? So it's like almost, um, uh, it's like a, it's almost like protecting yourself from being sucked into any one thing. And in a way, I think, you know, the, the juxtapositions uh, lecture series has, I think it has that as a kind of mandate. It's interesting for me now looking back or, or, or looking at this term today, you know, in 2023, because um, I think it, it has lo lots of sort of different meanings perhaps now, because I think we've gone through also something that happened from 2015, 16 onwards was a, uh, like a war on the idea of experts, you know, like a war on the idea of expertise. I think the pandemic was a very, um, visceral example of this. It was like, you know, why should we listen to, I don't know, pharmacologists? Why should we listen to virologists? You know, some soccer mom in Florida really genuinely believed that she knew better, no? And, and so I think, you know, we have gone through, uh, I think, quite a long period. You know, politics, like formal politics, has a, maybe has a lot to answer for this. No, there's a great deal of, there's often a great deal of, like, suspicion uh, cynicism uh, towards professional politicians, to the professional politician class. And I think we've seen that sort of trickle down into the, into the very idea of expertise. Um, at the same time, you know, we, um, we now have uh, supposedly 
uh, the possibility that the, the, this next kind of generation of, of AI is here to replace many middle class jobs, right? Like very mi all these middle class education, educated vocations, such as journalism and graphic design, are things that maybe some of you uh, are hoping to do. And I mean, there's something, I won't get into it now, but there's something really interesting. If you look at the history, I mean, AI is not new. I mean, I think you have to situate AI in something much broader, which is, which is automation. And, you know, if you look at the history of, like, the Industrial Revolution in the 18th century, you know, which classes were affected most? By and large, for a very, very long time, it was the working classes. No, it's the kind of proletariat, it's the agrarian classes, etc. We are now at a stage where it's the educated middle classes that are um, under the most amount of threat through this kind of new technology. And this is something, uh, and I, I do think this is one of the reasons it's, it's such a kind of alarmist uh, topic in the media, because in a way, you know, the, 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 the media class is one of the classes that are under, under this threat. So I think this, there is a whole, you know, um, we are certainly entering into a new kind of epoch of where the question of professionalism, amateurism, of agility, um, of this notion of that continuous education, um, you know, has, has, is being transported forwards yet again. Um, I, I used to do uh, an event at the Architectural Association in London every summer called Format, uh, and one of the formats one year was called Career Format, <clears throat> and I just wanted to kind of introduce the idea um, to you. Again, it, it, might be, it might be something to think about. So if the design of one's own pers persona is perhaps the very first work that any creative career requires, can't we also picture the narrative of intentional or unintentional decisions also as a design or story or artwork? When you're starting out, do you look to the shapes and sensibilities of previous protagonists in your field elsewhere? not for what they produce, but for how they maneuvered through space, time, opportunity, and adversity. Careers only make sense looking back, never forwards, and the most interesting examples can be seen as works in their own right, full of predestination and poetic serendipity. Um, and, you know, one way in which I think uh, something I got very interested in uh, is this idea of a life, uh, a career, um, as as a kind of work in itself, no? And and the and the, and the person whose life and career that perhaps has meant the most to me is that of Jean-Luc Godard, the the uh, the filmmaker, Swiss-French filmmaker who passed away last year aged um, <clears throat> 91, and I wrote this, you know, I spent years actually writing this, what I called a prelogy, so I actually wrote it before he, years before he died, but I knew he would die at some point, but I decided I was going to kind of chart out how his life, the various chapters of this incredibly long, um, often controversial, um, uh, you know, immensely eventful, but also immensely, immensely prolific life, kind of impacted me, um, and not just through what he produced, but really through the very way in which he lived his life. He has this beautiful phrase, which he, uh, he, it's called the identity between love and work, the identity between love and work, you know? So everything, you know, the, the, the relationships that you have, um, you know, everything sort of is part of that kind of fabric, you know, of the identity between lo uh, love and work. And, you know, this is, uh, I mean, one thing I would suggest to you is to really look at, at, at people's lives as, you know, not just, um, you know, not just the things that they said, the things that they made, the things that they produced, the things that they put out, but the very way in which they led their life, right? Like, um, and... Uh, you know, which is why you know, biographies are very, very, very good. Documentaries are great for this. But I found it immensely, um, uh, immensely kind of 
helpful. Uh, you know, I don't come from a family or a background or a culture that set me up for anything that I wanted to do. Uh, it was like being thrown into something, you kind of have to figure it out yourself, right? So where are you going to find these navigation instruments, you know? And one of the ways that I found them is through looking at people's lives. And so, you know, uh, of course, this uh, important uh, Renaissance book on the left, Vasari's, you know, which is really one of the first attempts, you know, at looking at lives of artists, not just the things that they produced, but really the lives that they led. And that, you know, every life, of course, takes place at a specific point in time. It's conditioned by sets of contexts um, and you know, circumstances, macro, micro, technological, biographical, familial, genetic, medical. You know, all of these things are very, very specific. Um, you know, and then Hans Ulrich uh, updates this in, in his book, Lives of the Artists, Lives of uh, the Architects. And you know, I, um, I was a co-editor of uh, his second book of uh, interviews, you know, Hans Ulrich's conducted over 3,000 hours of interviews now over thir at least 30 years. He's kind of addicted to this, um, this process of interviewing. But I have to, I, it's also something that I, I do and I, do, and, and I recommend it, actually. It's, a, it's also a really fantastic way to, you know, to engage with the people that you either know or would like to know in a more personal way. Or, uh, or again, this idea of like mining people's lives. Um, uh, but I do, you know, I absolutely recommend, you know, getting hold of Hans Ulrich's interviews. They are incredible insights, I think, into the shapes of people's lives. And really the last thing I want to mention is, the, is a book that he, he's done with Isolari, which is a really interesting publisher based in, in London that produces these tiny little sort of cigarette box um, uh, uh, books. And it's a um, it's a fantastic uh, interview with James Lovelock, um, and James Lovelock was many things, but he's he's most famous perhaps as one of the co-authors, along with Lynn Margulis, of the Gaia theory, who I'm sure some of you will have, have heard heard of. Is this idea that you know Earth is essentially a kind of self-regulating system, um, and you know it's a theory that was met with a lot of like scientific. Uh, resistance at the time in the 60s and then over the decades has absolutely been proven to be completely you know scientifically correct no? and um, but this you know this is an amazing you know he he died recently aged 101 years old and you know his, he wrote a book on the Nova scene you know at 100 years old it's like 99 and this incredible life no, of invention, of inquiry, of uh, discovery, also of resistance. You know, like, and, um, and so, yeah, I do recommend uh, this uh, book, but indeed all of, uh, all of Hans Ulrich's uh, interviews. And do you know it's the end of my <laughs> presentation? Well, you do now, so thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, for this wonderful lecture and a lot of food for thought. Now it's question time, so get ready for questions. And again, you know, no shame in the game, no such thing as a stupid question, but I'll break the ice and actually I'll follow your advice. Let's look at life. Let's talk about your life. Um, how did you get to what you were doing? Before we started, we were chatting a little bit outside in the courtyard that you have actually background in architecture. So maybe we can start or finish off or whatever, continue in this next round here on a more personal level, because I think that's quite interesting for all the um, students here too, how people end up doing what they're doing. Because it appears maybe obvious to us, but it's not really. No, no. And in your case, for sure not. So maybe you can elaborate on that. Yeah, I mean, as I was telling you outside, I, you know, my, my biography is important. That's, what I, that's why I do refer to these things. You know, I'm, I was born in Bangladesh to uh, you know, a father who was, um, you know, the first person in his family to go to university and become a doctor. Then, you know, we moved to England um, in the mid-1970s uh, for him to join the National Health Service, which at that point didn't have enough doctors and nurses, so they basically went out to the British Empire. And, um, you, know, uh, the, you know, one of the 
consequences, let's say, of, of, of the British Empire in, within British Imperial India was actually setting up very good universities. No? So they, they did produce extremely um, ed well-educated, talented graduates, and especially in, in the kind of medical field. And so there was a whole wave of South Asian doctors and nurses that came over to England in the late 60s and the 70s up to the early 80s. You know, so I'm very much part of that. But, you know, I grew up and in lots of provincial towns in the north of England, and I knew from a very young age I didn't want to follow what my dad did, you know, as much as I respected what, what that was. You know, I just, just got sucked into other things. I just, I loved ideas. I loved art. I could draw and I could paint. You know, there was, like, honestly, like, God-given skills. But then when I told my parents, you know, I, hey, I want to go and study English literature or I want to study fine art, they were like, no fucking way, <laughs> not going to happen. You know, they'd spent a lot of money that they didn't have on a private education for me throughout, you know, from age five. And, you know, all they wanted really was that I would get, you know, a, a, a really good degree and something that would be professional and that something would, um, you know, would set me up for life, right? And, and for them, the idea of an artist or a, or a writer was, I mean, that's fine to do as a hobby, but those are not, you know, that's not a proper, proper job, right? So the one thing we did agree on, which is also, uh, it's, a, it's a kind of fetish and a fantasy of every South Asian um, parent, is that, you know, I should go to Oxford or Cambridge. Uh, you know, it's one of the ways in which um, post-colonial subjects find themselves, like Stockholm Syndrome. <laughs> it's like, uh, we want to go back to, like, the, the mothership of, uh, of, of, of where all that kind of... Um, thinking started from. Cambridge had a, an architecture faculty. And um, I thought, well, and it, was, it seemed to be the artiest thing that was available at Oxford or Cambridge. And so I, I tested that on my parents. And, and this is the thing, you know, if well, what I call traditional cultures, um, you know, when you say architecture, they really think of, they think of it synonymously with engineering. They assume it's technical, it's vocational, no, it's a professional thing. You're going to come out, you'll get an office job, you'll be set up for life. Um, little did they know, or little did even I know, although I had some sense, that you know, the faculty at Cambridge was, at that point, a centre of like, phenomenological philosophy in the world. <laughs> and so you know, the first week I'm doing seminars on Heidegger and Derrida and uh, Bergson and Merleau-Ponty and whatever, no? and I'm at Cambridge University with all its amazing, like here, no? these incredible resources to, to go and sit in on, on, uh, on anything you want to. And so, you know, I, I end up studying architecture, but in a place that, that tre treated architecture in the broadest sense, uh, really th presented architecture as a kind of... Um, product, but also a sort of mirror, no, of history and of, of, of society, of culture. And, um, you know, I did my dissertation on Godard, on Pierre Le Fou. Mm. I, you know, literally anything you were interested in, you could just pursue that. If you wanted to be more technical, you could, but there was basically, it was in a sort of open field. And so, you know, I, Douglas has a great term for, he says, he says, architect, oh, this, the, the subject of architecture is a kind of psychic dustbin for you know, kids who, um, for, for different, for whatever reason, aren't permitted to go and study art or, uh, or, or, or literature. No? It's like, and I was just telling you, Lucas, no? I think often that has, might have to do with your ethnic background. It might have to do with where you are in the class spectrum. No? Um, if you're of a certain kind of working class, this idea of like, it's like no fucking way. No? So whereas there's, there's something about architecture that, you know, feels as, um, or at least from the outside, it feels like it's, it's more, um, I don't know, solid. Mm. But, you know, that then became my gateway. I then went to work for Zaha Hadid, who you know very well. I wanted to work for Zaha, not because she built, but because she did these beautiful paintings. Mm. To me, she was, a, she, was an, she was a visionary artist. And, and then from there, she helped me go into the, uh, to do my uh, graduate studies at the Architectural Association in London, which is also an extremely famous experimental school where people like Rem Koolhaas, but pretty much everybody went 
also run like an art school, frankly, extremely open. You know, I'm studying with, again, with Godard scholars, with, you know, Zizek is coming to lecture. It's just like anything you want, you can do that. No, there are no limits put on it. So, yeah, I, it's, you know, I had this, edu I, I had an incredible education. Um, but I, I think the best thing about those educations were that they never, um, they never contained me. No, yeah. they you were you were told to cultivate your curiosity and pursue it. No, and uh, and I think um, to me that's a that's a hallmark of a really good education. I mean, I think it is important to like learn some basic shit, um, and and in that sense, you know, I think that there needs to be some structure. Like at Cambridge, you know, we did, you know, we did the history of Western civilization from the Agora through the Forum, you know, et cetera, et cetera. I am so grateful I have that background. It's like um, uh, McLuhan. It's like he has this incredible, like, um, armature of, uh, of knowledge that was a product of probably a very conservative education. But then he's able to apply that to all of these, like, um, emerging um, cultural, technological trends. And, you know, if there's, I th it's basic, I mean, no, I'm not trying to compare myself to him in any way, but I think that's essentially what I try and do. No? It's yeah. like you try and use the, the schemata from this kind of history or this kind of, or an education of this sort of history, which I think are tools that you can then apply to, um, what's happening today, right? Mm. So I hope that helps. Yeah, yeah beautiful. Actually, I, I like this um, observation of architecture in the way it's also a bit of a Trojan horse. No, you can get a lot in through the you know, title of architecture with the A. And two weeks ago, I don't know how many architects are in the room amongst you guys? A few, so a few weeks ago, there was like the first presentations, the first colloquium of the master students in architecture, 28 no, that are graduating this year. Of these 28 projects, there were three, make it four, architectural projects. It's a graphic novel, a film, a literature piece, a performative thing. So the modes of representations have completely changed also in that field, which you also see in the Venice Biennale right now. Like, it's, it's not the classical architecture of the A anymore. Now to you guys. Who dares? First one, Enzo, please. And speak up very loud, and ideally um, we repeat the question so the online audience uh, can hear it too. Thank you very much for the presentation. I think there's lots going on in my head and uh, not speaking only for me, if I say so. Um, I would like to uh, ask a question about the title of the book of uh, Extreme Present, which is five years ago maybe Extreme Present, so now it's not anymore. And I think when you showed the, the, the photo of the emojis and um, explain how uh, there's so slightly differences in, uh, in the meaning of the emojis. I was wondering, um, I think if I would have my father next to me, he uh, totally wouldn't understand. Yeah. And uh, maybe someone 20 years older also would then use them completely different. And so my question would be how, uh, when you work on a book like this and you select artists, um, how do we make sure that uh, you always still um, keep up with the uh, development of technology and communication, which you, as you said, quoted, getting faster and faster? Because I think I'm 30 now, and like, even for me, it's TikTok, like, I opened the app and I was like, oh, what's that? It's somewhat so different from what yeah. I know. Um, and I was really challenged by it. Yeah. So I'm wondering, do you have any strategies hmm. in that sense? I mean, well, I, I have to say, yeah, this book came out 2015, and I feel extremely relieved, but also vindicated, because it's actually become more relevant. <laughs> um, and, and so during the pandemic, it was like, a number of these pages just came to life. You know? Like, there's one somewhere it says, uh, you know, in the future, every day will feel like Thursday. 
<laughs> That's what happened. No, we, we were living also in this like perpetual Thursday for, for, forever. No, it's like, what, what day was it? Yes, no, it didn't matter what day it was anymore. It was just perpetual Thursday. So, um, and I think uh, there, it, it's a great question. And I don't necessarily, I can't give you like a specific answer other than I think what you, I mean, two things come to mind. One is, that there's a natural tendency as we get older that our kind of um, the, the, the sort of width, width of field naturally closes, right? Um, and I mean, music is the best, is the easiest answer to this. No? Like if you, you know, if you were like, I don't know, 12 or 13, I knew every single I don't know, new musician, new song, etc. I simply don't anymore. Now, th the structure has changed completely. You know, we don't have like the charts in the same way, and et cetera, et cetera. But I think there there are certain, you know, there's. It's said that, for example, with uh, um, with fiction, that um, there are studies to to suggest that um, men, boys, men, stop reading mostly stop reading novels at around 21. Um, whereas women continue. So actually most of the fiction um, industry is set up actually for female readers. Whereas non-fiction, um, more men read non-fiction. So there's a kind of natural thing. So there are these, these like natural neural pathways that happen as we get older. Um, you know, also just life changes now. Like other things come in, become more important. But I think the danger of that is that we then lose, like you said, no, the capacity to, um, uh, to feel in intimacy and connection and understanding with things as they're developing. And it, it gets harder and harder. But the, I think the only way to do that, and you know, one of the reasons I think Hans Ulrich and Douglas and I, we get on so well and we understand each other so well is that I think we make, we make um, curiosity a kind of daily practice. Right? Like, you have to be aggressively curious. And you have to be, you kind of also have to aggressively counteract your, this natural tendency that you might have to want to kind of um, separate or close yourself down, no? And so, yeah, I spend a, I spend a long time on TikTok. Mm -hmm. I don't, you know, I, I um, because I realize it's, it's, you know, it's a completely different, like, neurological, cultural space and it's something I want to, uh, I need to understand. And, and I think it's something that we learned, or I certainly learned from McLuhan. McLuhan was, he, you know, he was like, a, a, as a person, he was a very conservative, you know, he was a practicing Catholic, sort of married with the same woman his whole life. He dressed like this very dowdy, like uncle, you no, know, in three-piece suits. But, with his work, with his um, research, he put all of his own personal opinions like outside the door. Mm. You know, for him, it was just important to immerse himself in whatever was happening without judgment. And you know, this is something I think that is, a, is very important. We often, we're often led, or at some point, I think we shape our the scope of our perception through our own personal, like, moral or ethical judgment. Th there's a problem with that, I think, because it's another way in which we close down the possibility of really engaging with what's happening. No? And so I think it's, it's important to have beliefs, and no? it's important to have your own moral systems, your moral codes, and so on and so forth. But I would, I would, I would suggest it's important to not be limited by them. No? Because it's like it will stop you venturing, venturing into places um, that you need to go into. So, you know, um, and, th and then maybe the, other, the second thing I would say is that, that um, the thing about, uh, you know, everything is, everything that's produced is always a, a product of a very specific time, no? So, like, we could take a photograph here and of all of us, uh, we could all look at the pic photos in three years, six years, nine years, 
There are ways in which what we're wearing, how we're wearing things, the insignias that we're, you know, at the moment, they don't give a, a clear sense of being dated, like, but we will be able to look back and they will be dated. Some of those things will fall into, you know, it's the same way, you know, I, you look at pictures of yourself, from, I'm like, how the fuck did I dress like that? <laughs> like, you know, off the charts cringe, but then there are moments where it's like, ah, oh, I mean, I look back at how I was dressing as a teenager in like 1990, and I'm like, damn, that's like, that's lit, no? Like, that would totally, like, all of that's come back now. So the, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a really, it's a crapshoot about the things that will date badly and things that will date well. I, honestly, you can't predict it. But I think that you just, I think you have to be committed to, you know, try and tell the story as truthfully as you, as you can, you know, about, how, about any moment. Um, but the last thing I would say is that, you know, if you look at David, I mean, David Bowie, the last image in the extreme self is this, like, death mask of David Bowie. And, you know, I always say that David Bowie was really the first extreme self. He was, like, the first extreme self. Why? Because he, he, he sort of realized that actually to find, uh, to liberate himself, because he, was, he, wasn't he was, it wasn't born David Bowie, he was born David Jones. Extremely, like, middle class, shy, like, he was, he was painfully shy. He hated performing. He wanted to be, actually, just, he wanted to be a songwriter for other people. But nobody would sing his songs. They thought they were shit. So he started to sing himself. He went through all these, like, iterations. Um, none of them really succeeded until he spends five years with this very famous um, mime artist um, uh, and... And uh, uh, called uh, Lindsey Graham, and Lindsey Graham basically uh, teaches him how to use his body, but also teaches him the the, the power of inventing characters, right? And so, so David Jones then invents David Bowie, and then David Bowie invents um, Ziggy Stardust, and then Ziggy Stardust, and then David Bowie kills Ziggy Stardust, and then invents the Thin White Duke, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So I only mention this because David Bowie, from the period of about 1969 to about 1982, was somebody that was, I would, I would always say he was like, you know, six minutes, six hours, six weeks, six months in the future to everybody else. And it was like he was sending us signals back from the future. And, you know, that takes, I'm not saying that's something that you can necessarily, like, I don't know, train yourself to do or something, but it's... I do think, and that's why I did spend a lot of time talking about history today, because I, you know, I think you have no clue about diagnosing the future without an incredible, I think, grasp of what's happened in the past, mm -hmm. because things are things are cyclical, you know. So, um, so yeah, you know, I would just say like actually learn history, <laughs> like learn learn history inside out, and keep your curiosity as. You know, it's like a, it's like a, it's like lift doors, you know, that want to close. They want to keep closing. You just want to kind of keep them. You got to keep them. You force them open, so that you can look out. It's the hardest. It's it, it's something that hopefully will come very naturally to you now, many of you at your age. But it does get harder as you get older. Mm -hmm. But it's like it's a it's a practice, you no? Know, I think that you have to. You kind of. Have it's to kind of the core mantra of what this whole lecture series is about since four semesters, no? Yeah. Constantly keep that door open. <laughs> keep the door and open. open and open. A uh, very complex question and a very beautiful and elaborate answer to that. Another question. Yes, in the very back and two in the front. Yes, you go first and it's loud. Did you make a lot of money on these books? <laughs> Did you make you a lot of money on these books? Billions. Seriously, they look like something that can sell very good. Yes, I wish. Um, no. Books are, uh, I mean, if, uh, we could have a whole separate conversation about, oh, yes. uh, you know, the, the sort of, there are many ways in which I could tell you not to live my life <laughs> uh, if you, you know, if you care about money. Um, and uh, books, are, unfortunately, are becoming more and more of a kind of black hole when it comes to making a living, unfortunately. But, um, but no, I think they... I, what I've loved, what's happened with the books is that they're really out there in the world. And actually, wherever I go in the world now, like, 
people know them, and they kind of know me and us through the books. And the, 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 the moment I knew we were doing something right was when, I don't know, 14-year-olds or 15-year-olds were like, OK, I can see my life in, the, in this book now, you know? T to your point about, you know, I'm 48 years, like, I'm 48 years old. Doug is like 62, Huo is in his 50s. You know, we technically have no right to pe peer into the, the kind of minds of, of very, very young people. But um, again, I think somehow we, we're getting it right. Um, I think it's important to also not lecture people, right? Like to not moralize. Mm -hmm. um, and so, and that's why, I mean, I didn't talk about this, but I, I could and I should, but you know, humor is so, so important, no? And I think you can convince people about things um, like a hundred times easier, uh, but also with more grace if you use humor. Mm. And I think, you know, um, and so, but it's about switching tones, no? There are, there are times where it's important to be, to be somber. It's important to acknowledge the gravity of the situation that we're in. Um, but there are times to also, you know, do, do the very, very opposite. But, but no, in short, I didn't become phenomenally rich doing these books. Um, there's, there's a tiny talk, tiny, let's see what happens, who knows, but of, um, you know, a friend of mine works in LA for like production company and he was like, have, you know, do you like the idea of turning the book into a TV show? And I was mm -hmm. like, hell yeah. <laughs> so, you know, fingers crossed. <laughs> Nice, fingers crossed. One. But a good question. But for the record, if you, I mean, I've, I've edited around about thirty books, and you do not get rich from books. So if you have a book in a bookstore that costs, let's say, ten euros, then you have to think the bookshop buys it for five, fifty percent off. And of these fifty percent, as the author, you get maybe in the spectrum of usually four and to max hardcore good deal twenty percent of these fifty percent. So it's very little. So if you want to make money. Either you have, or become like a super um, author of a crime story. But um, who was you too, no? Uh, maybe you and then you. And then uh, I see you in the back. Uh, yeah, so um, my question is about expansion. Uh, so um, this quote by Goethe, like, the songs make me not I them, like, it was on one of the first slides, really resonated. And you also mentioned uh, that you elaborated on this idea of the book being an expansion of the human eye that McLuhan. Um, like wrote about in his book, but I also remember that in, I think it was your scene manifesto, if I'm not completely wrong, you actually argued for the complete opposite, like humans being an expansion of the smartphone already. So how do you kind of envision the future in an age where actually our emotions and thoughts are more and more directed and controlled by the set of emojis we have on hand or the algorithms that dictate what we see on screen? So which kind of expansive force will be stronger, us shaping technology or technology shaping us, and how could this work in collaboration? Yeah, I mean, so, yeah, it's worth, re it's worth reminding you all that uh, yeah, one of the arguments at the beginning of the medium is the massage is, is really this, I is this idea that, um, I mean, McLuhan writes, he says, all media are extensions of man. Forgive the genderization, but that's what, you know, it was the 60s. Um, all media are extensions of man, so he has this idea of like media environments, you know, so that, um, uh, and so as, as you say, you know, the, the, the book is the extension of the eye, the wheel is the extension of the foot. It's a very, um, uh, it's a sort of anthropocentric um, model uh, of where we create these prosthetic technologies, right? Um, and, but he was, uh, McLuhan also had, uh, would often use these two terms, feedback and feed forward. So, you know, he would say, you know, we, we create media and then essentially media recreates us. I wrote a piece uh, not so long ago that takes this as a starting point and, um, and I, I suggest, as you say, that Whereas, you know, at some point we would have said that this device is a sort of extension 
you know, it's this ex extension of my hand, which is connected to my wrist, which is connected to my arms, which is connected to my body and connected to like my brain or something like that. But that somewhere in the last few years, uh, something's what I call the great reversal has happened, right? Where we are now actually, you know, you could say our brains are extensions of this you know, or whatever this is in here. And that this is one of these very profound kind of um, like Copernican shifts. Um, where, you know, where, where we thought the center and the edge was actually turns out to be mm. the complete opposite. I profoundly believe that this is the case now. No? But it is, it is, I think these, uh, these, ex these, um, these vectors are, they're, they're multidimensional, no? They're, they're, they don't just happen one way, no? So feedback, feed forward, feedback, feed forward. And, um, and so, so, yeah, I think that, but, but I think it's, it's important for us to acknowledge that, no? It's this, um, that, I mean, this, this whole idea, particularly, let's say, of like uh, algorithmic, like al algorithmic prediction, which of course, you know, we see now in everything from like input chatting to, you know, Amazon, I think, for maybe for many of us, it would have been like one of the first examples of this. You know, this idea that Amazon knew what we want um, before we know we want it, right? And we're going to see this. We're already seeing this through advertising, etc., etc., etc. So, so much of um, that power relationship, I think, has already um, inverted. And you know, I think it's just it's important to remind ourselves that 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 that, that is the case. That 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 is what's happened, you know. Mm. I mean, the last thing I would add here is that, you know, for years there was this idea of like, people are spending two hours, 18 minutes a day on the phone, or, you know, people are spending like uh, four hours, 30 minutes on their devices. I think now the real metric would be like, how many minutes are you not, <laughs> right, looking at your screen, or looking at a screen, or being somehow like, that to me is is the new metric. No, whereas I think for a long time it's like you know the alarm is and the hysteria is about look how much time we're. I mean, frankly, I mean obviously, obviously you're all, you're all aware now of the the Apple uh, you know Vision Pro headset and the, the the vision of the future. No, that that is now inaugurating um, what they call spatial computing ultimately. And I mean. I, it's no, I don't think it's particularly controversial to, for me to suggest that, you know, Zuckerberg's idea of like a VR future was always, you know, always going to meet this very sudden sort of dead end because literally, no, I mean, who wants to be stuck in, you know, with this sort of device just trapped in a kind of virtual world, metaverse, et cetera, et cetera. Whereas the reality is we already live in an augmented world, no? Like, when I navigate through the city on Google Maps, what is that space, no? It's already a kind of augmented. And I think now, you know, we are, um, I mean, some of you would have maybe watched the new season of Black Mirror, yes. right? Um, but I think Char Charlie Brooker just said, because he was asked about the Apple launch, and he was like, well, yeah, basically, we, you know, we came up with this 10 years ago, no? Um, in that one of the early episodes, no, where you put that contact lens in and you can play back, play mm. forward, right? Like that whole thing. I mean, that's, that's essentially the future that spatial computing, I think, is, um, is aiming itself towards, no? And, and in that sense, you know, where do we... Yeah, that idea of the prosthetic, of the hard edge, no, between our body and technology, it just completely dissolves, doesn't it? And, I mean, ha Donna Haraway was talking about this nearly 40 years ago in the Cyborg Manifesto. It's just, it's taking time. It's, you know, technology takes its time to kind of get there. But, yeah. Severine, you had another question? Yeah. And then uh, Kai and you, and then I think we have to wrap it up time-wise. So, quick questions and, yeah. I found it very interesting when you described the process of making those two books that you said, especially in the second book, the three of you wrote the text and then you shared it with these 70 plus artists. 
would you say that this process of creating this book through some sort of like network knowledge yeah. was an essential part of, of getting it on point to the way it has been? Definitely. I think we, you know, we're real advocates of this idea of like collective intelligence. Of, I mean, that's why I showed at the beginning you know, that, the, I mean, that the medium is the massage is often attributed to McLuhan. But I, I, I resist that. You know? I say it's actually, it's, there are three authors here. You know? There's three minds that came together. There is no way that book would look and feel the way it does without Agal and, um, uh, and Fiore, right? Like, and, um, uh, you know, I, uh, I think there is, you know, if, if you can, I mean, the thing of collaboration is either like living hell or it can be the most, you know, it can be a, a beautiful thing that produces things that s simply could not be done, no, by an individual. And, you know, I think life is, one of life's journeys is sort of figuring out the people that you can work with and the people that you need to avoid. Um, I think I, you know, we're lucky, the three of us, that we've we sort of found each other and I think this is a relationship will go on till we die or something. Like, like there's no downside to it. But, uh, you know, Hans Ulrich, I mean, that, um, one of his greatest contributions is, you know, I just sit down with him and he rattles off, you know, the list of artists or people that we need to contact. He's like, Craig Green, this, 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 you need to da 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 da, no? And somehow, yeah, it's a, there's a, there's, there's a kind of neural architecture to the book that, that is um, way bigger than us. And that's definitely important. It's also in, a, it's also in the tone of the, of the narration. If you notice, if you go through it, it's not a single, like any of you, you know, if any of you one day sit down and decide to write a novel, the first thing you'll have to do is actually, I mean, you'll have to decide where, where is it set, um, what tense does it take place in, what subject do I write in, right? Do I write in first person? Usually you write in first person or third person. Sometimes some books have used the second person, it's not used that much. Um, and, and that uh, point, that POV usually has to stay the same throughout the book. Our POV shifts constantly. Sometimes it's we, sometimes it's you, sometimes it's us, sometimes it's me, you know, sometimes it's... And, but I think that's also, no, how we, we're so used to that, you know, we can have 16 tabs open on our browser and each one will have a different POV Again, going back to that idea of like cinematic editing, we are not, we are, we're highly accustomed to sh constantly shifting between points of view. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, yeah, the books would simply not have the texture and the richness, uh, also the humor and the depth. Uh, did we not also invite and um, kind of collaborate with all these, you know, incredible people, no, and their, and their, and their own sort of uh, perspectives on the world. So yeah, I totally agree with you. Then Kai and, uh, yeah, the world to the right, but Kai, you go. Uh, thank you for the talk. Um, it was really interesting claims and thoughts set up. Um, I felt like it was always like the final, the final outcome that you presented in, 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 in the books and, the, yeah, and also in the presentation. Is there, uh, the first question would be, is there something like a, a yeah, fully formulated book where you like kind of describe uh, really clearly how you got to these thoughts. That would be the first question. The second question would be, um, is it scientifically backed up? Because it's kind of like a mix of the philosophy, social science, graphic design, and art in a way, and it's very heavy claims. Like, is there a scientific backup for your claims? I mean, the second question first. Uh, some of it, for sure. Uh, you know, I did a, I, I, when the first book came out, I was invited to do a uh, BBC radio program um, about, uh, really they built it around the book. It was called How Long Is, it was, it was called How Long Is Now? And so it's this idea of the present, you know, like, um, and whether our, our experience of the present um, is actually contracting, etc. So, you know, I was on there, then I was, there was also a neuroscientist on there. And there's been a, you know, there's been a ton of research done on, like, for example, I mean, I'm actually talking about this on Thursday in a different 
context um, in Milan, uh, a session about reading. No, like um, so, there is you know there's been a lot of scientific um, research done about. Um, reading in relation to people's attention span. No? So this question of attention span, is it really atomizing? No? Is, it, uh, is our capacity to focus on things really shrinking? There is a lot of scientific. I'm not saying it's all, um, there's not necessarily like one consensus. There's a lot of sort of discussion, but there's a, there is a lot. I mean, there's one page in the book, uh, which I was amazed um, a couple of weeks ago, so, uh, which, uh, says, loneliness, loneliness is as bad for you as 15 cigarettes a day. Now, I, did t I took this from a scientific report um, in a, a few years ago. Two weeks ago, the, uh, the chief medical officer of the United States suddenly has a press conference and the headline is, loneliness is as bad for you as 15 cigarettes a day. Right? So, um, which he then named something like the loneliness epidemic. Um, so yes, there are, I would say, uh, a lot of the claims are uh, come from scientific um, reports or research. A lot of them don't. A lot of them are speculations, you know, in the way that fiction, science fiction in particular, uh, is, uh, are, is a practice of speculating or asking questions. Mm. And so, yeah, it's not, but that's what I mean about what I was um, uh, trying to explain to the previous question. It's, it's, a, it's a book where there is a, it's a sort of polyphony of voices, you know, and some of it is empirical, sort of hard-edged. Some of it is just wild, wacky, ridiculous absurdity. No, but again, I think that's how we kind of live our lives. No, like we, on our feed, we will have, we will, you know, we'll be confronted with a kind of plethora of content, and some of it will look, some of it will be truly scientific, some of it will look pseudo scientific, some of it will actually be an attack on science. No, and I think one of our like basic tasks as a human today is processing those different registers of, of information. No? And, um, you know, just go on YouTube and put in, you know, is, is, is the world really flat? There, there are more people today, I think, who think the world is flat than there were a hundred years ago. Um, because in a way there's more people that can kind of congregate together and produce a sort of pseudoscience, no? And just the last thing I would say is there's another bit in the book where we, it says, you know, what's the difference between a cult and a religion? Uh, the answer is a, roughly about a hundred years. <laughs> so, you know, the thing, uh, 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 we're, we are living in a, you know, a, I think a very interesting but also volatile time that, um, you know, breakdown of consensus-based reality, you know, post-empirical truths, yada, yada, yada. Mm -hmm. no? So again, it's not, it's like the, the, the arrow of, uh, I don't know, epistemology is not a straight line. No? It's not like we got to the enlightenment in the 18th century, the scientific rigorous method and like everything was plain sailing. We, I mean, now with deep fakes, no? I mean, it's uh, the, this business of what is, you know, authentic, what's a copy. You know, we are, we are deep, deep, deep in that now, mm -hmm. it seems to me. Um, so, yeah. Maybe anybody, one more uh, and then we... Maybe actually, there's so many more questions, but they're really running over time. So, I would like the last question I saw to just come forward uh, once we're done with this. And because uh, I have a final question for you as well that you need to answer. And I would like to also, because I was thinking in a way you summarized so many things that at the, at the very, very core why I started this lecture series here. And they happen to all start with a C, <laughs> I realized. One is curiosity, which you mentioned. And I said before, to keep these doors of curiosity open is really the main intention of the seminar or this course or what I do here um, uh, as visiting professor for transdisciplinary artistic education. Then the criti criticality, like to be curious, but also critical at the same time. Just don't buy everything. Look, be curious, but be critical. 
And then obviously, and that's the way you work, the way you describe the process, the idea of kind of collage or cut up as a working methodology. Um, in the beginning you said the way you work is like you put things together that maybe don't belong and they create new narratives, new, new context. Um, so contextualization, it's, it's funny, it's all C's, contextualization. And then, um, and I'm very thankful that you asked it, so instead of collaboration, that things happen, you know, it's my mantra the whole time, work with others, collaborate, collaborate, collaborate. And with that comes the collective intelligence, all terms that you just mentioned. But this is really the summary yeah. of what this is about, what I'm trying to you know, um, bring across in this lecture series. So I'm immensely grateful for that. So we have obviously many more questions here in the audience, but we have one final question for every speaker here. And it's, what's, the, what's the final piece of advice that you could give these becoming designers, architects, artists, etc.? Don't listen to me. <laughs> Ignore everything that I just said. Um, no, I, look, I, 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 maybe that, that, what I was trying to get at at the end, that um, really uh, educate and en enrich yourself about uh, the lives that have preceded you. you know, like really as they say in the crypto world, you know, do your own home, you know, do your, do your own research. Um, but but in, a, in a really substantial way, no? not just like reading the Wikipedia page, like pick up an actual biography, you know, watch a really, watch a really good um, documentary. Um, because the thing about, yeah, I, I, th I think there's a, there's a, there's, there's a mis uh, portrayal of that's been done for centuries really which is why the Vasari book is so important that you know works of culture works of um, expression um, sort of exist ex nihilo or they just sort of happen that's bullshit it's absolutely bullshit no um, you know who your parents are were you know where you're born you know all of these things are extremely it's fantastically um, contingent on you know what you're able to do, not able to do, how you're able to do it, all of these things. No, and uh, I personally have found it just extremely uh, enabling to uh, you know like educate myself about the different circumstances through which people um, you know had to like produce themselves no? through either with or against their own circumstances and um, it just made me feel less alone right there's a, there's a sense I think often again you know you might you might be the perfect Nepo baby with your future perfectly kind of laid out because mom and dad can get you in the right publishing house you know I'm very happy for you good luck but many of us don't have that and so things can feel yeah they can feel intimidating they can feel alienating so you know try and do things and whether that's through collaboration or just I mean friendships are yeah they're my, they're my lifeblood no I mean um, for uh, psychological for emotional but also for sort of professional reasons no they are so I think just maybe dispel the idea that you could really do anything by yourself um, because you can't. Um, or let put it the other way, you could do a lot more with others. You know, it's just figuring that other what the nature of those relationships are. You got you know your whole life to do that. But I think that that's an important part. Yeah. That's a beautiful note to end on. So, a warm applause, please, to Schumann. For An incredible lecture today and a beautiful conversation. Thank you also to our tech team who stayed here over time. Thank you for being here. Next week we see each other with another uh, wonderful contemporary cr critical mind. Uh, that's uh, Emily Siegel, founder or co-founder of K-Hole. She actually, funny, she coined the term of norm core. You brought the lower core, core yeah. now into it. So we'll continue on that path next Monday. Have a wonderful evening and thanks again. Bye-bye.